Um, let's look at Exodus chapter 20, starting with verse 1. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. And God, as we just go into your word today, we just pray that you please strengthen us, guide and direct us, help us to understand your word a little bit more clearly, and just give us a guidance and direction that we need to be faithful to you. Praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So what we're reading here is in Exodus. This is right when the Israelites came out of Egypt, and God was telling them how to be his people. One of the things that God had forbid the Israelites from doing was worshiping other gods, whether that was a made-up god of one of the other nations, or whether it was some kind of idol they made, even if that idol represented God. They were not allowed to worship an idol. They were not allowed to worship false gods. However, Israel did not remain in their own borders for their entire existence. In fact, they would sin. And God would become angry, and God would punish them, and he would send them off into other countries where they would live under the reigns of very powerful yet wicked kings. So here's the question I want us to ask ourselves. How would the Jews keep the commandments of God that we see here in Exodus during the captivity and the rule of, of evil kings? This was a challenge that three... Jewish males would face during the exile. I want us to look at their account today. Because I think we can learn a lot from their experience. No matter what a wicked leader may command, we must follow God. Let's take a look at this evil command that the king gave in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Scripture reads, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, Babylonia. He had summoned the satraps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial office officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So to say traps, perfects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before it. Then they heard loudly, then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all peoples and nations, and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Some may say, well, King Nebuchadnezzar didn't know any better. He was an evil king, and he was not a Jewish person. However, I disagree with what people may say. King Nebuchadnezzar knew better. Why? Before this event... Nebuchadnezzar was introduced to the one true yeah. God. How can I know this? Because the scripture tells me. When you look at Daniel chapter 2, starting with verse 27, you see that he was introduced to the one true God. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mysteries he has asked about. 
But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dreams and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, king, O king, may know the interpretation that you may understand what went through your mind. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of baked clay. While well, you were watching, a rock was cut out, not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff or on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron. As iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks through piece, things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partially baked clay <coughs> and partially iron. So this will be a divided kingdom. Yet you will have some of the things, some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partially iron, partially clay, so the kingdom will be partially strong and partially brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor in order that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel made himself, well, Daniel himself remained at the royal court. God revealed himself to a mighty way. King Nebuchadnezzar. He showed him that he was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God Almighty. Nebuchadnezzar was not ignorant when he made this command here in Daniel chapter 3. He had full knowledge of the one true living God. Nebuchadnezzar ignored this great act and he did evil. He did evil at least three ways here. What was the three ways that King Nebuchadnezzar did evil? Number one, he worshipped an idol. He himself bowed down to the ground to worship this great idol that he made. Ninety feet high, nine feet wide. He himself bowed down. He was worshiping a false image. People have debated, what was this idol? Was this idol something of Nebuchadnezzar? Was this an idol of one of his false gods? I don't know. 
doesn't matter. He worshipped the false idol. He himself broke the commandment of God. Number two, he led others in worshiping an idol. It wasn't bad enough that he himself had to sin against God, but he had to lead others in doing it as well. There is something about sinners that it's just not enough for us to sin against God. We've got to drag others into it. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. Number three, he punished those who would not worship an idol. He said, if you will not bow down, and if you will not worship this idol, I will throw you into this furnace. Not only was he sinning, but he says, if you try to refuse, I'll kill you. With a horrible <coughs> death. Three things that Nebuchadnezzar did after he ignored this great act. I want to say this about us, as human beings. Even though they are introduced to the truth, some individuals will continue to do evil. You can introduce somebody to the truth. You can show them the scripture. You can show them the evidence of why they should believe the truth. You can tell them exactly what they have and have not done. And what they need to do. And how there is a God in heaven. And how this God cares for us and wants us to worship Him. But some people will ignore that truth no matter what. And they will continue in their evil. Their hearts are bent on evil. Even though their head knows the truth. You can't make the decision for them. Wish I could. I wish I could get every single person and make the decision for them to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Problem is, doesn't do any good if I make the decision for them. Every individual has to choose for themselves to serve the one true living God. And they have to believe the evidence that God has given them. How would the Jews in the royal uh, court react to this command that Nebuchadnezzar gave? Let's take a look. Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 8. <coughs> At that time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing fire. But there are some Jews whom you have sent over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made very good. If you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the burning furnace, the God we serve is able to save us, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The three young men refused to worship the idol, even with the threat of death. What I think makes this even stronger, a stronger testimony for them, is they were standing in the face of an angry, powerful king. The most powerful man on the face of the earth at that time was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar said, if you obey my commandment, very good. If not, I'm going to throw you into that furnace. They were standing right before the king. This was not going to be here. Say the king wasn't going to hear somebody else say that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego disobeyed the order. He was going to hear it from their lips to his ears. That takes guts. It's one thing to talk 
about how you won't do something. It's another thing to stand in front of the most powerful man on the face of the earth and tell him you're going to ignore his command. In fact, I think the young man gave an incredible statement of faith. This shows their complete trust and faith in God no matter what. Number one, they acknowledge that God could save them. This is going into a fiery furnace. They say, oh, yeah, well, our God can rescue us if he wants to. Because they had known the history of Scripture. They knew how God wiped out Egypt with the plagues. They knew of how God had parted the Red Sea. They knew of how God had done the miracles through Elijah and Elisha and all the great prophets of the past. They knew that this was not a challenge for God. And they said, before that king, our God could save us. But to me, it's their second statement that shows a real trust and faith. Even if God did not save them, they would not worship the idol. So in other words, it's saying, we know he can. He may choose not to. And if God chooses not to, for whatever reason, we will still serve him. You know, I think this is a strong statement because we don't always understand why God doesn't answer our prayers. Let's be honest for a second. Let's, let's step away from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's, let's talk about us for a second. How many times do we pray for something and earnestly mean it? <laughs> Desire, and it may be something that is essential to our lives, we think. To avoid us getting out of some kind of trouble. Or to avoid us going through a heartache and pain. So we pray to the God of heaven and earth, Oh Lord, please answer this prayer. And God doesn't answer it. Well, actually, he does answer it. Just not the way we want him to. It then becomes a struggle for us to say whether we're going to continue serving God or not. Because some people, when God doesn't answer their prayer the way that they want, will say, I'm not going to serve you anymore. However, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no idea for sure what God was going to do. To our knowledge, God did not give them any type of revelation to say what he would do. They just came with this complete trust and say, no matter what, we're going to do the right thing. Even if it costs us our lives, we will do the right thing. God does not have to answer our prayer the way that we want him to. We want to serve God because it's the right thing to do. God calls us to be faithful, no matter the cost. I think one of the things that's a struggle for the American church today to do is think that we have to have this perfect situation for us to really follow God. If we follow God, He's going to give us health and wealth and prosperity. Sometimes we don't understand that serving God sometimes is the ultimate cost, and God calls us to be faithful. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and will per suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be heard at all by the second death. Satan likes to push us as far as he can to make us doubt. He likes to push us as far as we can to make us step away from God. What God is saying is don't give in. Do not stop. Keep moving forward. Take the hits. Because something better is coming your way. See, it may not be death that Satan threatens us with. It may be our jobs. It may be our family. It may be our health. 
It may be our position in life. It may be some type of persecution. Whatever it is, God calls us to be faithful, and He knows a way of making things work out. In fact, that's what we need to look at next. How did God react to Nebuchadnezzar's command and challenge, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's statement of faith? Well, we've got to go back to Daniel chapter 3, looking at verses 19 through 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, the furnace so hot, that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then appeared, approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. The satraps, perfects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then, Shadrach, then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship another god except their own god. Therefore I decree that, every, that the people of any nation or language who said anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turn, be turned into a pile of rubble. For no other god can save them in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. God waited till after they were thrown in the furnace to show his mind. And I didn't want to highlight the word waited there. God could have stopped King Nebuchadnezzar at any point. The first time he issued a challenge, he could have made him drop dead in a heart attack right then and there. He could have appeared in the sky and cried out. He could have done a lot of things. He didn't. He waited. He waited to that moment to show his full might. Now, some may ask why. I, I think it's because God accepted the challenge of King Nebuchadnezzar to show them that there was one true God. You remember what Nebuchadnezzar's challenge was? What God will rescue you? What God will rescue you from the fire? God says, okay, I can accept that challenge. In fact, I, I will show you how it's done. The three men did not die, even though the soldiers did. The soldiers that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the furnace died for their act. Not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they lived. Number two, the flames did not harm them. Didn't even harm their hair, didn't harm their clothes, didn't harm a thing. They didn't even come out smelling like fire. I can tell you, that must be something interesting, because every week we're around that campfire down there at, uh, uh, on Sunday night, I come home smelling like smoke. Yeah. And I'm not even on the fire. I'm just near it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in it. God sent his angel to help them. The angel went in. The angels made sure that they were safe. They even walked in the flames. Now, there's some things in Scripture I think is really kind of cool when you stop to think about it. Jesus walking on water is pretty cool. I wonder what it was like to walk in the flames. 
Can you imagine that? Thinking you're going to die. All of a sudden there's this angel and you guys are just hanging out, walking around in the fire. I, I don't know what you talk about when you're standing in the fire, by the way. I, I don't know what that conversation's like. But God said, here's your challenge. I answered it. Even powerful kings cannot stop the Lord and his might. King Nebuchadnezzar was the top man in his day. The most powerful man in the world. Couldn't stop the Lord. Couldn't stop his might. Couldn't even damage it. God took the best thing that Nebuchadnezzar could throw at him and laughed. We need the faith to follow the Lord no matter the circumstances. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood there before King Nebuchadnezzar and didn't blink. We need the faith to follow the Lord no matter what. So here's the question. As we look at this world, it challenges our faith. As we look at this world where Satan tries to make us deny the Christ, will we be faithful? Or will we give in to temptation? Now, that's only a question that you can answer. See, we call this a moment of invitation because people have a decision to make. Whether it would be to repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sins and give to the Holy Spirit. Whether it would be to rededicate your life to Christ. Whether it would be to repent of the sin. Whether it would be to ask for prayer from the church. Whatever it may be, we give you the opportunity to make a decision as we stand and sing our invitational song.